It was early in 1964 that David Oldmeadow and Malcolm Douglas gave up their jobs to travel Australia. The dogs shared the excitement and dangers of the trip. Suve is dead. Scruffy survives. Climbing into the front seat is Malcolm, who came to boarding school in Australia from the phosphate island of Nauru. He left school to join a wool firm, working on the big outback stations, and later becoming a stock agent in the bush. Malcolm and David originally planned to be away for 12 months. The 12 months stretched into four years. Always moving on, looking for new adventures. How does such a journey begin? They bought a Land Rover, spent 12 weeks fitting it out and buying equipment. On a cold winter day in June, they left Melbourne behind and headed north. Many city dwellers must long to do the same. For most, it would be better to share David's and Malcolm's experiences through this film. This remarkable film deals with the last 12 months of this journey, showing areas that few people have ever seen. From Darwin to Cape York, through little-known Arnhem Land, around the Gulf of Carpentaria, then up the Cape York Peninsula to the very tip of Australia. Malcolm Douglas and David Oldmeadow take you across the top. Darwin, capital of the Northern Territory, one of the fastest growing cities in Australia. The port of Darwin, busy wharves on the edge of a tropical harbour. Nearby, the Methodist Mission supply boat has been beached for repairs. On the incoming tide, we climb aboard, ready for our trip along the Arnhem Land coast. Leaving the harbour, we sail out into Clarence Strait, heading for Van Diemen's Gulf and the Arafura Sea. The boat is manned by a captain and crew of full-blood Aborigines. They carry supplies to isolated mission stations along the coast of Arnhem Land. These settlements support about 3,000 Aborigines. Two days out from Darwin, conditions are good with only slight seas running. Three days and nights of this, and we reach Millingimbi. Supplies are unloaded, and we disembark. Suva and Scruffy have had quite enough of the sea. They're anxious to get ashore. For Dave and me, this is our second trip to the island. Old friends are here to meet us. Millingimbi is situated on one of the Crocodile Islands, three miles from the mainland. It's a mission caring for about 700 Aborigines. They camp beneath giant tamarind trees, which grew from seeds left here hundreds of years ago by traders from Macassar and the Celebes. Under the biggest tamarind tree, a group of Aborigines from the mainland is camped. One of these is Malangi. He should be famous, yet few people know of his existence. Malangi painted the design for Australia's one dollar note. Malangi is the only adult male left in the Manurunu tribe. Each tribe has its own ceremonies and totems, and only the fully initiated men are permitted to paint these symbolic designs. In 1963, Mr. Carol Kupka of the Paris Museum visited Arnhem Land to study Aboriginal art. He collected a number of paintings, including some by Malangi. Mr. A.C. McPherson of the Reserve Bank of Australia saw these paintings in Paris, and one of Malangi's was brought back to Australia. Eventually, it was chosen for the new $1 note. Some people say that Malangi's style has been influenced by Western art, but Malangi has spent most of his life in the bush. He's had little contact with Europeans. Malangi takes a few draws on a longi, a style of pipe introduced to the Aborigines hundreds of years ago by the traders from Macassar. Here, Malangi paints the story of the death of a great hunter, the original guardian spirit of the Munurnu tribe. 
That's the hunter in the center of the bark. He's been away all day hunting. He's caught goannas, emu, and wallaby. And he's collected wild fruit and yams. He camps beside a water hole, lights a fire, and throws the wallaby cut into pieces onto the fire to cook. A snake slithers out of the long grass, strikes, and the hunter dies. The figures squatting around the hunter are members of the tribe singing the story of the great spirit hunter and how he met his end. When Malangi finishes his painting, I show him a dollar note and he explains the story to me. This legend of the original guardian spirit being bitten by a snake and dying is always sung today when a member of the Manurnu tribe dies. This old woman, her face distorted by the dread disease leprosy, waits patiently for the end. Days later, she is dead. Dave and I, because we've been accepted by the tribe, are allowed to watch and share the people's grief. The dead woman's relatives keep up a continuous wailing and throw themselves on the ground. A blanket covers the dead woman and her closest relative, a sister. The grief-stricken sister appears for a drink of water and the wailing goes on. The husband shows his anger and drives the evil spirits from the camp. He believes these spirits caused his wife to die. All day, all night, the mournful wailing continues. The men gather and begin the long death ceremonies. These Aborigines believe that when a person dies, the spirit leaves the body and returns to the sacred tribal waterhole. Each tribe has its own waterhole somewhere in Arnhem Land. When the initial shock of the death is over, preparations are made to help the spirit on its journey. Age-old dances mime the wanderings of the soul to its final resting place, the sacred waterhole where the tribe actually keeps its sacred totems and ceremonial objects. And when the spirit finally reaches the waterhole, it assumes the identity of one of the sacred totems, usually a fish or an animal. These totems are now being painted on the bodies of the ceremonial dancers. The people believe that if they fail to give the spirit the correct farewell, it'll return and cause trouble. The tribe's sacred waterhole is symbolized on this man's body. This must be done so that the ancestors of the deceased know the correct waterhole to guide the spirit to after its wandering. paint is white clay mixed with water, the brush, a piece of stick chewed at the tip. Here, ritual objects are prepared for the dancers. It takes all day to paint the intricate designs on the bodies of the dancers, and finally, their faces are whitened with clay. spray painting in its oldest form. Backstage, the men receive their final instructions. They dance at sunset, and within minutes, the artistic designs on their bodies are washed away with perspiration. Leaving the preparation area, which is forbidden to women and children, the men move into the main camp where everyone can watch. The dancers stir up the imaginary waters of the waterhole, chasing the catfish. They mime the actions of all the animals associated with the age-old rites. And so the old woman's spirit is led to its resting place with song and dance. Leaving Milingimbi, we head for Nungalala on the Australian mainland. 
Scruffy and Suva have to travel steerage. The natives are afraid of them, and Suva doesn't like it one bit. Nangalala is situated on the edge of the vast Arafura swamp. That's it, marked in green. This is one of the most remote areas in the whole of Australia. The Arafura Swamp is only part of Arnhem Land. It's a huge area of wild country set aside for those Aborigines who still prefer to live a tribal way of life. These semi-nomadic people are the ones Dave and I are going to live with for the next five months. The camp at Nangalala is just a scattered collection of bark huts. The population varies from 20 to 80, depending on the season. It's the end of the day and the women are arriving back in camp after collecting firewood. That four gallon drum is full of water. It weighs at least 40 pounds. Each man has a number of wives and many children. And although these people are now Australian citizens with the right to vote, they speak no English and have little understanding of white civilization. When this baby is a young man, his tribal life will be gone, and this film will become a record of a lost way of life. This couple is exceptional. One man, one wife. The husband, Rachi, has been promised other brides, but he gave them away to his brothers. He's devoted to his first wife. As they sit together, she twists strips of banyan bark into bush string. It's very strong and Rachi will use it in his fishing nets, his spears and totems. And she'll use it for making baskets. Rachi carves a goanna, a lizard. He'll sell this to the mission, which will send it with other totems to a tourist shop somewhere in Australia. Rachi and his wife will use the money to buy commodities introduced by the white man, such as guns, torches and fishing lines. Now Pupu weaves a dilly bag. She'll use it to carry her belongings and for collecting food, wild fruit and berries. cheerful soul, though she suffers dreadfully from sore eyes caused by sleeping too close to the smoking campfires. Commotion in the camp. A python has just been killed and Jungle Bali becomes a teacher. He calls the children together and explains that this snake is not poisonous. It can be eaten. The python is not eaten raw though, so the children are giving a lesson in fire making. First take a loose ball of bark fibre, put it on the ground, Hold it in place with a strip of soft wood. The soft wood has been slightly grooved in one place. The fire maker puts a hard wood stick into the hollow and rotates the stick quickly. In a matter of seconds, the dust from the soft wood begins to smolder and overflows onto the bark fibre beneath. The fibre is picked up smouldering and then gently coaxed into flame. And there it is, homemade fire in 30 seconds. And once the fire is good and hot, the snake and a long-necked tortoise can be tossed onto it. Aborigines cook their food very quickly and eat it almost raw. With a genuine bark tablecloth and a hand for a knife and a foot for a fork, it's time to tuck into hot, steaming snake. Rachi says there are plenty of fish in the river and somehow this appeals more than snakes so we decide to try and catch them. Rachi tells us that the barramundi will be spawning in the overflow from the wet season and so towards the top of the river the boys and I organise the net. Dave motors to the very beginning of the river where the noise of an outboard is heard for the first time. He 
turns around and watches for signs of the fish. There they are, their dorsal fins breaking the surface. and I anchor the net securely to the banks and in midstream to stop the strong current ripping it away. We head upstream and plunge in amongst the fish to drive them into the net. What's for dinner? Just look at that, a great stack of barramundi. These are the most delicious fish in the north. They're caught in fresh water and in salt, although the freshwater fish are inclined to taste a little muddy. While we're at Nangalala, the government sends in a helicopter to assist with the preliminary surveys of the swamp. From the air, we can assess the potential of the area far more quickly. It's a strange feeling to look down on vast areas of Australia still unexplored and quite unknown. It's a fantastic natural sanctuary for the birds. Below, you can see the main tidal river near our camp. It twists and winds far back into the unknown interior. Dave and I intend to explore this river by boat. And then the helicopter crashes. Luckily, we're not on board for this flight. The pilot on another survey trip strikes trouble and force lands. We make up a search party and 24 hours later we find the wreckage. But the pilot's gone. Dazed and injured, he staggered off into the bush. Twelve hours later, we find him wandering, lucky to be alive. And we are too. There's a hole in the cockpit made by a rock, and that's just where we would have been sitting. Dodie, the bark painter, is one of the searchers. And while he's in this new area, he decides to get some bark before returning to camp. Dodie inspects many trees before he finds a suitable one. The bark must be full of sap, otherwise it'll split as it's removed. He places a forked branch against the trunk, climbs up and cuts the bark high above the ground. Finally, a stick is used to leave the bark completely free from the trunk. Deciding on the best section to use, he cuts it free. <coughs> now the long walk back to Nangalala. After heating the bark over a fire and keeping it flat with stones for several days, he begins. Dodi is the leader of the Wagalug myth. The Wagalug myth is the story of two sisters and their children as they journeyed through Arnhem Land in the dream time. Dodi paints a yellow ochre line. It represents the faraway land from whence the Wagalug sisters came. 
Dodie the painter uses yellow and red ochre, white clay and black charcoal. These are the only colours used in bark painting. As he needs them, the colours are ground on a stone and mixed with water. He treats the bark with the juice of wild orchids. This stops the dried ochre from flaking off. But to get on with the legend, the Wabilug sisters travelled through Arnhem Land, naming the rivers, the mountains, the jungles and billabongs. And these places are still sacred to the Aborigines to this very day. Eventually the sisters camped beside a billabong. And then a great snake, Yulunga, slithered out of the water and swallowed the women and children. The snake can be seen encircling the four figures on the bark. Yulunga became very sick, reached and spat out the women and children onto the ground, where they turned into stones. And these stones are still there and may be seen today. As he finishes the painting, Dodie paints in the rays of the sun. It takes Dodie a week to finish this painting, and then we sit together and he tells me how the Wagalag men, missing their women and children, set out for Arnhem Land in search of them. They discovered the blood-covered stones and they knew that something terrible had happened. That night, as the men were asleep, the spirits of the Wagalag women came to them and taught them all the sacred songs and rituals. The women told the men that they must circumcise their sons as a sign of manhood, a custom which is still practiced today. And at Nongalala, Dave and I witnessed one of these sacred initiation ceremonies for ourselves. These two boys are being prepared for the ceremony which will take them from the status of women to the status of men. They are to be made men of the tribe. From the ages of 12 to 14, all boys go through a period of intensive instruction in the myths and beliefs of the tribe. Before the actual ceremony, the totemic designs of the tribe are painted on the boys' bodies. Dave and I spent so much time with these people, we were allowed to witness these extraordinary rites. The ritual area of the camp is cleared and the final dances begin. Over the next hour or so, the tension mounts towards a frightening and unforgettable experience, even to an onlooker. of the boys. The singers and didgeridoo players begin their final songs. The dancers move in, surging around the initiative. The boys are placed on top of their uncles and pinned in position. The men cry out to help the boys bear the pain and prevent the women from hearing the screams. Once, a sharp shell was used. Today, it's a razor blade. The men crowd in around the doctor. You see, it's taboo for the women to watch. The circumcision over, the boys are rushed back to the men's ground where many taboos are placed on them. They're not allowed to speak for weeks. They must not eat many types of food. And to look at women is forbidden. The bleeding is stopped by placing a heated leaf from a particular tree over the wound. The leaf stops infection and promotes healing. The tension over, the proud doctor takes a drink of water from a paper bark vessel. With the ceremonies over, the dry season ahead, the men prepare to go walk about. The main preparation is the making of spears. The shafts are long jungle saplings which the men heat over the fire and straighten while they're still hot.
Jungle Bali uses his powerful jaws to complete the job. These men intend to walk from Nungalala to the Arafura Billabong, where a number of their relatives are hunting crocodiles. Remember that river we saw from the helicopter? Dave and I plan to get to the headwaters by boat and then walk across to meet the tribe. This should take only three or four days using the outboard motor. Aborigines approach in a dugout canoe. They're hunters from Milangimbi. Shortly before our arrival, they had killed the biggest crocodile in living memory. We were staggered by its size. It's gigantic. Never had anyone seen such a monster as this. Even the old men say it's the largest croc ever seen in this region. And it takes 10 men to drag the monster from the water to a clearing where it can be skinned and butchered. crocodile like this is a major operation. Years ago, the skin had no value, but today it'll be sent to Darwin, where there are good prices, $140 for this one. The men shot this croc with an old wartime 303 as it was sleeping on the riverbank, and then they harpooned it as it slid into the water and pulled it back to shore and finished it off with an axe. Such massive jaws. Crocodiles of this size are a menace to cattle. And here you can see its tremendous size. The hunters are more interested in the meat than in the skin, and more care is taken when the carcass is butchered. The backbone is removed, exposing the stomach, heart, lungs and intestines. Considerable time is spent looking for a small hormone sac amongst the fatty tissues near the stomach. They tell us that this provides a juice which stops infection when applied to wounds. Now the heart and intestines. The natives dote on the stomach lining just as tripe lovers enjoy their tripe, but with this there are no onions. The meat is divided up according to the position in the tribe. The more important members get the best cuts. Five hours later the crocodile is nothing more than a blubbery lump of meat. The skin is rolled up, ready to be sent by canoe back to Millingimbi Mission for sale to dealers in Darwin. And we continue up the river. Towards the top of the river, conditions deteriorate. Half-submerged logs and floating debris from the last wet season make travelling very difficult. At last, the head of the river. The water's too shallow to continue any further. The 
river is still tidal, though we are many miles from the sea, so we unload our gear and store it well above the high water mark. It's a long walk from here to the Arafura Billabong. You know, few white men have ever been this way. But we were here two years ago, and the Aborigines showed us the way across the hills and through the swamps. And this time, we hope to find our own way. The smoke ahead, which means the men from Nungalala are not far away. They burn the country as they travel to make it easier for walking on their return. to the hazards. <coughs> now Suva joins the party. Both these dogs attack snakes without fear and only instinct protects them. One bite and either dog would die just as quickly as Rastus. Our first dog died in 1965. Night's over, and Suva rejoins Dave as he begins looking for a campsite. Evening comes, and with it, chilly mists and vicious mozzies, and we roll in close to the glowing fire and the pest-proof smoke. The swamp people have heard we are coming. They've left a newly made dugout canoe on the bank of the Arafura Billabong. Dave and I paddle precariously to the other side. And there they are, waiting. These people are really the last Australian Aborigines living as a tribe on their tribal land. And even so, civilization has caught up with them. They wear a few clothes, and the young men carry rifles more often than spears. Their few possessions are purchased on the occasional trips to the mission to trade. Bundalil is a hunter. He tells Dave about a piece of steel he's just acquired and how he intends to make himself a new fish spear. The handkerchief on his head and his singlet are always clean. Every morning he bathes and washes his clothing in the nearby billabong. Dorichinini has a bag full of tortoises for his relatives back at Nungalala. Tortoise is the best food the swamp has to offer, so he says, but I'm not so sure. This little girl is terribly shy. She's had practically no contact with civilization. It's an old bush saying that where there are goannas, you'll never find snakes. Perhaps this is why. Dave just shot this goanna, and inside there's a snake as long as your arm. Dave gives the goanna to new mama. He's delighted. Goanna's a real delicacy here and it's soon sizzling on the fire. There's not much fat on most bush animals, but these goannas have a thick layer of yellow fat on each side of the tail. The Aborigines really go for this in a big way. One of the most interesting reptiles in the swamp is the file snake. It gets its name from a very rough skin which resembles a rasp or file. The file snake lives in the water. It's tremendously active and swims at a great rate. But put it on land and it loses all control of its movements. It isn't venomous and if handled gently makes no attempt to bite. But treated roughly, it can turn quickly and inflict a nasty wound with its large teeth. How do you catch a file snake? Come with us and share an amazing experience. On the way to the billabong, Nulmama spears a goanna. And then, through the tall 
swamp grass, we come across a backwater covered with water hyacinth. The men wade in and drive the snakes towards the bank. The reptiles panic, and as they try to double back, they are grabbed by the swamp people. fish leaps. These billabongs are infested with crocodiles. Just before I shot this film we saw a big one slide into the water, but no one here seems to care. Milperu grabs a tortoise. And the drive goes on regardless of crocodiles and fallen trees. To kill a file snake, the jaws must be held tightly closed to stop it biting as its spine is snapped. This boy is one of the few Aboriginal children left learning the old ways of survival. He copies everything his father does. As the snakes and tortoises are caught, they're quickly killed to prevent their escape. after the morning's hunt, snake and tortoise is naturally the main course for dinner. Tortoise, rich in protein, is always cooked in the shell. that got away. After the hunt, the men rest while the women do the cooking. Tortoise meat is white and oily, but after long periods in the bush, it tastes delicious. The afternoon is spent sleeping, and later in the day, the croc hunting begins. Hunting crocodiles from a dugout canoe using harpoons is a highly skilled art and only the most capable hunters are successful. Milperu is the best, but it's a team effort and he'd be lost without his paddler, G'day G'day. Milperu sees a croc and signals directions to his paddler. The paddler, often unable to see the crocodile, works only by signs. He must be accurate and silent. Milperu drives the harpoon home, aiming for the back of the skull, the center of the nervous system. It's still very aggressive and G'day G'day takes no chances and bails out when it attacks him. Milperu tires it out before pulling it into the canoe the second time. If the croc is exhausted now, G'day G'day is still nervous. He hesitates before going ashore. three weeks, these two men caught 18 crocs worth $800. 
Dave shot this one near the camp. When a crocodile is shot, it sinks straight to the bottom. After 36 hours, it floats to the surface and the skin is still valuable if taken straight from the decaying body. This one stinks and it's a case of move the croc or move the camp. Dirichinini thinks I'm mad going to so much trouble pulling the croc onto high ground, but my idea is to build a hide nearby and film the birds feeding on the carcass. By moving into the hide before dawn and waiting, not even the crows are aware of my presence. And then the hawks arrive, driving the crows away. The sun comes up, things really begin to hum. In this climate, what with the heat, the maggots, the birds and the insects, a carcass disappears in no time. And this is all that's left after five days. <laughs> 